Welcome back, everybody. It is with great pleasure that I get to introduce our next guest. Ross is a former deputy head teacher who has worked for 27 years teaching in some of the most challenging secondary schools in London. Ross truly understands what it's like to be in many of your shoes. Ross started his own non-educational blog back in 2007, which went viral. Ross then carried this blogging on into the education world. And I am sure I speak for many of you when I say that we are truly grateful that he did. Ross's advice is real, it is evidence-based, and it really puts teacher well-being at the heart of everything. Ross, we are truly looking forward to you sharing your experiences with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emma. Good um, morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you today. I hope you've had a, a good morning so far. I've been following um, everything on um, Twitter, uh, uh, where I often find myself. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. I hope you can see that on your side. Um, what I'd like to do this morning is share my own insights into um, the last 10 years, at least, my own fascination with teacher workload. Um, I guess it's when I reached my own crisis as a deputy head and as well as the blog inadvertently becoming a full time job. Um, so I was trying to manage it all and then trying to think of ways that I could support my teaching staff and also trying to find ways to be more effective uh, personally and as well as professionally. And, uh, you know, my blog's now um, 13 years old um, and I've observed lots of teacher behaviors on the site. Uh, you know, what topics uh, are useful, um, what type of, uh, you know, what time of the year, those types of things. So I want to kind of share uh, some of the insights that I've uh, discovered uh, on the website as well as physically. So last three years I've been working full time in schools. Um, all around the world. Um, obviously, pandemic, it's all switched to remote. Um, so I want to kind of share that. Before I start, I just want to kind of uh, just pitch the presentation um, correctly so that you're, I want to kind of take you through a bit of a, uh, a bit of a headache journey to begin with, the pressures that we're all under, and then signpost some great uh, resources that you can probably do to try and reduce your workload um, personally, as well as in the team around you. Um, I firmly believe that teaching is a team sport. Uh, I don't believe that teachers can share uh, complex solutions by themselves. Uh, new teachers particularly need experienced teachers around them. And I, I, I'll, I'll joke throughout the presentation, that there's a special place reserved in hell for teachers who don't share. It's really important to share your wisdom. So all these ideas that I'll share throughout the day in the workshops as well, um, are, are not my ideas. They're ideas that I've learned from the colleagues around me. So it's really important that we, we share with each other. Um, my Just Great Teaching research started with, and this is very evident now during lockdown and COVID with all the narrative in the media, um, the perceptions by the general public, uh, you know, some of the controversial things that I've heard, you know, the clickbait type of stories you'll see in the press, teachers are at home on full pay, you know, teachers lazy, all that kind of uh, you know, without naming newspapers, certain newspapers berating the teaching profession that they don't want to be in schools. It's quite the opposite when you look at the research. Um, but prior to COVID, um, I, I was frustrated with the narrative that um, in England wasn't performing as well as it could, despite squeezed budgets, increased performance in PISA rankings. You could argue that we were doing really, really well. So I wanted to highlight the work that schools were doing, the things that I saw in my travels. And, and, and shift that perspective and, and also share with the schools and the wider profession is how we all deal with the same challenges. So I've identified 10 areas and I'll, I'm going to take you through the research, but I'm also going to get you to do a little bit of uh, give me a bit of feedback on some of the surveys. And um, this is just a snapshot behind um, my website. So, if I, you know, 13 million readers, which is just crazy. Um, but if you look on the top right, uh, marking's the number one topic. It always has been. And in the last three years, I've been to probably 250-ish schools, um, 30,000 teachers face-to-face. -face. Marking is the number one topic that drives teachers crazy in any type of school, internationally as well. So I always say to school leaders, um, do your best to strip back the marking burden for your teachers, then, then you're going to do them a massive favour. Um, the second biggest click is differentiation. I think this is from per the per perception of what it is and also uh, a lot of new teachers coming into the profession trying to understand what it looks like in the classroom. And then from a school leader pers leadership perspective, 
being able to re reliably evaluate it, I think, also. So I, I do my own little challenges with Ofsted, trying to evaluate methodologies and see if we can actually d evaluate differentiation over time rather than a one-off observation. Um, a lot of middle leaders tell me that they don't want role play, but they often struggle with support and challenging difficult conversations with colleagues around them. So I, I guess throwing that back to you, how can you encourage um, this kind of area of professional development need for your middle leaders without having to do the role play type of thing and one other tip um i've written over two thousand blogs uh, and i've got lots of secrets and i'll explain some of these in my workshops later how i've managed to achieve this um, but the average reading time is a minute and a half it's no surprise teachers are very busy people we live in a world of constant notifications so people that create policies or executive summaries, you're looking at 300 words. So uh, I've got a colleague at Cambridge who's looking at digital screen time with pupils and uh, where their eyes go on the screen, but also looking at the average reading time. You think of uh, TikTok and swiping through videos. We're really competing to keep people's attention these days. So for teachers, executive summaries for policies, uh, one and a half minutes would be my top tip. And um, this is a, a behind the screens uh, bit of data for my Twitter. Um, every every month, about five to ten million people, it's a big extreme, depends on the seasons, uh, see my tweets. So, I, you know, I started off with one tw uh, Twitter follow just because I wanted to be curious and ask questions. And now today it's approaching quarter of a million, which is quite frightening. Uh, so I've got a bit of a responsibility, one, to make sure that I don't tweet after a glass of red wine, two, to encourage the next generation of teachers, three, to offer support and challenge, even during difficult circumstances such as COVID, and also challenge government policy ministers. So if you go on my Twitter feed today, you'll see a tweet that I put out about free school meals, which went a bit crazy. Um, but on Twitter, every three months, I put out a little survey. So there's one on my Twitter feed at the moment. I've been trying to work out what are the workload influences. Now, I don't think I'll ever get to the bottom of it. But if I could just steer your eyes on this screen, the, the blue line is school leaders. Now, we don't mean head teachers here. I mean anybody with a teaching and learning responsibility is a school leader. They are responsible for the workload of other people. Now, you'll notice it's gone down significantly. I'm going to show you some latest data uh, shortly. Uh, the red line is Ofsted, so you can see the latest curriculum reform. You can see how that's increased over the last um, year. And I've also just wanted to divert your eyes to the green line, teacher habits. Just because you mark all your books, does it make you an effective or a good teacher? Um, you know, all the observation stuff. You know, I, I want to work in a school where I can share my car crash moments rather than watch Ross teach this amazing lesson, teach right like Ross. And the, the things that I've seen on my travels, more schools are shifting toward this. Let's uh, have an open culture model where we share difficult moments and we help one another solve complex classroom problems. Um, so I'm sharing that with you there also. Um, now, this might fail, so let's just see how we get on. Uh, I'm going to put this link on the screen here. Um, if you can type it into a mobile phone for me or on another tab on your device that you're watching from, I'm going to activate a survey, and I'm going to just gather a bit of anonymous data from you and just get a sense of the pressures that you're currently under. So this can be live workload feedback. And then later on, I'm going to activate the survey again and ask you about some of the, the data that I've collected, 10,000 bits of data in schools across the UK, and just get your uh, understanding of what the pressures are that schools are under. And this is prior to the pandemic, and I'll show you what the current pressures are also. Um, so if you can put this on your browser, please. I'm just going to activate the first one just so that I can see that you're connected. I just want to know what you've had for breakfast. OK, so if you can put in your... Um, mobile phone, P-O-L-L-E-V.com forward slash teacher toolkit. Great, so I can see it's coming through. Or on your browser, it can be all lowercase, polyv.com forward slash teacher toolkit. So it's almost midday. And uh, a couple of you, I can see, haven't had any breakfast. Um, so I'll give you another 30 seconds just to get connected. And then I'm going to switch to the more important survey, not this one. Um, and then I'm going to ask you about workload. Okay, so we've got 50 odd responses. Okay, we've got one person who's had a, a full English breakfast. Lucky you. Okay, um, right. So here's the real survey. So now we're getting connected. So Paul, P O W -L, L E V dot com forward slash teacher toolkit. This is the question I will really want to ask. 
Um, what's your number one workload issue? Just type in one word and then press submit on your device. It should automatically refresh. Okay. And then once you've typed in one word, type in another word and press submit again. And let's see if we can all enter four or five words each. And I'm hoping we can get easily plus 100 responses on the screen. So you can see the res number of results in the bottom right-hand corner. So I'll give you 30 seconds to do that. So one word at a time, as many as you can. Um, it's not... Uh, it's anonymous, but there's no filter. So if you type Emma's name or my name, uh, it will appear. So uh, please be cautious. Okay, so we're plus 100 results. Great. Now, I'll tell you for free, marking's the number one thing that comes up everywhere I go. Marking, marking, marking. Um, when I'm with NQTs, it's obviously planning and behavior. With school leaders, um, it's safeguarding parents and emails. Uh, I've got no idea why that's going small, <laughs> uh, but marking you can see in the middle, the larger the word, the, the bigger the need. So we can, we can see emails, meetings, paperwork, and planning there. So I'm going to move on. Thank you for your responses. I'm going to come back to this slide a bit later. Okay, so what I'd like to do next is, um, this is, um, some of you may remember Nikki Morgan. We've had five Education Secretary of State's uh, since 2013, when she initiated the Department for Education Workforce Survey. F and this happens every two or three years. Um, 44,000 teachers responded to this survey. You'll see at the top, 56% of teachers said they were frustrated with putting in data on, on Progresso, ISAMS, SIMS, whatever platform you use. So I'm showing you this for comparison as to where the pressures are today. Second one uh, there, 53%, so almost 24, 25,000 teachers said marking, detail and frequency. N uh, marking policies that have a number on them, mark once a week, once a fortnight, once a half term, uh, purple pen of progress, all those types of things, in my opinion, aren't conducive to progress. Um, third one I'm going to put on there, um, interesting that we're on an inset day, but staff meetings. Are your staff meetings a good use of your time? Uh, you've taught a five period day and then you're brought together for a, an hour after school. You're given a huge to do list and no time to do it. And um, there's tons of research on effective meetings, rotating the chair, stand up meetings will go quicker, which is great for work, uh, having difficult conversations with parents. Um, walkabout meetings are great for your mental health. And of course, with COVID, all these things have to be put into context. But staff meetings there, a quarter of percent of people originally said, um, they're a waste of time. Um, you know, if you if you take a teacher's salary, let's just take a UPS salary, over the year you divide the cost per period. It's about £2,000 per lesson. So if you're bringing all your teachers together for an hour after school, it's a huge cost to the school. So you'd better make sure that the meeting's well worth, um, and it's gonna have well worth the time, and of people's time, it's gonna have an impact. Um, why do teachers leave the profession? So the number one reason all the research that I read is workload. So obviously within this is marking, planning, behavior, uh, administration, all those types of things. My current research, so I'm in my third year doing my doctorate at Cambridge, I'm looking at Ofsted influences. Um, I was um, quite <coughs> instrumental in uh, helping abolish lesson gradings in 2014. My research has now shifted to lesson gradings of schools. Um, you know, I've worked in all different types of schools, all challenging schools uh, down in London. Um, but, you know, special measures are now outstanding. I've pretty much done the same thing. It's the location, it's the demographics of your pupils, which make a difference. And obviously the goalposts. So I want to see if Ofsted goalposts or headline metrics that the Ofsted outstandings and special measures have any influence on teacher headcount, house prices and knife crime. Uh, my opinion, it does, uh, and I think it might be actually um, exacerbating poverty and inequality across the UK. Um, poor behaviours there, as is um, teacher salary. These things are, are all the factors that why we leave the profession. Uh, we need to be paid more. We all suffer from difficult classes, but workload's always the biggest reason. Um, actually, there's been more teachers' requests to go part-time than ever before, about 27, 28,000 people. Uh, obviously, through COVID, once we see the changes of this, it'll be very interesting to see where the landscape lies. 
Obviously, um, we're very lucky to have a job still during COVID. Uh, many people will have lost their jobs, so a, a huge spike in applications. So for the first time in eight years, we don't have an application. Obviously, there'll be certain subjects, but generally, applications to join the teaching profession are uh, the highest they've been in nearly eight years. Um, now, let me steer your eyes to this slide. If you look at the bottom right-hand side, first of all, this is a comparison between 2019 and 16 with workloads. Uh, the biggest shifts in workload have been number one, marking, two, data, three, lesson plans, four, behavior, and five, appraisal. Now, if we shift our eyes to the top, the interesting thing is a lot of schools have looked at their marking and assessments. 23% of teachers said it's got better, which is this blue line, uh, blue code here. But the light blue, 25% said, yes, we've looked at it, but it's made matters worse. And if you filter your eyes down the lines, data, 35%. Yes, we've looked at it. It's got worse. Behavior, yes, we've looked at our behavior policy and things have got worse. So this slide I find quite fascinating. And I've been slowly unpicking some of the reasons behind this. So this is all on the teacher workforce survey if you're interested in that data. Now, you're going to laugh here. Um, the, teacher, the data on teacher workload goes back 20 years. So you can see the data along the bottom of the slide. If you're a classroom teacher, you're working at least 45 to 55 hours on average, and this is before the pandemic, uh, during the working week to keep up with your work. School leaders out there, uh, 55 to 80 hours is the average. Now, believe it or not, um, on the right-hand side, lots of reports have suggested that teacher workload has reduced. I suspect, and this was published at the end of 2019, there's no doubt during the pandemic workload has gone through the roof. Uh, so I'm going to show you the latest data later. Um, now, I'm just going to pause. Um, I'm going to try and keep an eye on the questions and, and maybe um, Emma or someone might pose a few things to me as, as we go. But um, there's a bit of research that says pausing is very useful for long-term retention. So I'm just going to take 10 seconds. Think about your workload at the moment. What are the biggest pressures? So you said marking emails and planning. Uh, what are those influences? Okay, so I'm going to show you some research that I've been up to. This is before the pandemic uh, and then current research that I'm up to at the moment. Um, the 10 key issues. So I've left funding aside and I, I thought about all the places. This is just a snapshot of where I've been on my travels. My last physical job was actually in a school where I was a, 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 as a student in Fleetwood uh, last month. But before the pandemic, it wasn't until March. Um, since the pandemic, I've been pretty much connecting with schools in South Korea, Brazil, all over the world, um, and really getting to understand how they're responding to lockdown and the pandemic, as well as supporting schools across the UK. And so that's just a little snapshot of the things that I've been up to. Here are 10 schools that I selected for my research, and this was published in my last book, Just Great Teaching, in September 2019. These aren't the best schools. These are just 10 very different schools that I had a relationship with that I wanted to identify 10 influences that all schools face. So here, I guess the closest school to you um, geographically would be Slough and Eton. Um, all the schools, you know, got primary, secondary, independent, grammar schools, a whole spectrum, and plus a lot of data from Northern Ireland. And collectively, about 10,000 sources of data inputs from all the teachers involved. So here are the 10 schools on the left. And then on the right hand side, these are the 10 areas that all schools struggle with. Now, prior to the pandemic, uh, take that into context. And I've left funding aside, which also has an influence on many of these. All the schools with me behind the scenes, we had a little bit of a fisty fight. And they all said, we do this one thing really well. And I wanted to talk about each of these schools, how they deal with all the same issues we all face with, but one of the areas that they do really well. Um, so Slough and Eaton, a really great research-led culture. Um, Peter Collins, the head teacher there, just fantastic work going on. So I'm going to share um, the data that I collected. But before I do, I want you back on your devices. So if you can go back to pollev.com forward slash teacher toolkit, if you've got your tab open, it should automatically refresh. Tell me the areas where you think head teachers said they find challenging the most. So open up your tab. OK, you should be able to choose three or four responses, I hope, on your device. And then I'll give you the results. So I've got three surveys for you and then I'll show you the bits of data. OK, 
Okay, so it's clear we're going with teacher well-being. So we're just going to make a note of that. Teacher well-being, everybody, is the, the where teachers find the challenge. Okay, the next survey I want to initiate is, let's see if I get the slide moving on. Oh, gone too far. There we go. Uh, teachers lacking confidence. Where do our teachers lack confidence the most? Okay, so we've got what was a kind of two horse race between or three horse race behavior, SEN, mental health with assessment company, <laughs> like a horse race here. Okay, I'm going I'm gonna go with SEN, okay, for teacher confidence. Uh, and then the third survey I'd like to ask you is um what do teachers find challenging? Okay, so we've got SEN again as a clear front runner. So this is really interesting because when I do this initial bit of research in different areas with different schools, the data broadly uh, says the same messages, but obviously context, primary school, secondary school, international, they're gonna elicit different results at some point. Interesting that nobody said teaching and learning is a challenge or CPD. Um, so that correlates with some of the stuff that I found. Um, so let me just show you some of the results. Head teachers said they're really confident in managing pupils' mental health, teaching and learning, and curriculum choices. And um, where they struggled with the most was managing teachers' well-being. Ross, go home. Don't worry about your books. Don't worry about X, Y, Z. Managing pupil mental health with limited resources lack of psychologists, counsellors on our doorstep to give us that support, and also accessing all this explosion of with research. It's great to see so much research coming emerging across the profession, but there's so much of it. I can't keep up. I've got to focus on my day job. Some of the research is 30, 40 pages long, if not more. Sometimes it's behind a paywall. It gives some recommendations, but I still have to translate it into my own school setting. So there's still more work to do. So it's a real challenge. So that's where the head teachers say the greatest influence is in these 10 schools. No, there's 32,000 schools across the UK, 23, 24, 25,000 in England, uh, 18, 19,000 primary schools. So it's a small snapshot, okay? And um, teacher strengths, hallelujah, teaching and learning and planning were the biggest forces. So we've got those nailed. Mark, plan, teach is where teachers focus their energies. And my advice to everyone for today, school leaders, I know there's lots of pressures, but we should be stripping back as much as we can and letting teachers just focus on managing people's mental health and their own and the business of the classroom. Mark, plan, teach. Teacher challenges, managing your own well-being. So conference on well-being. How do you know if you're struggling? Um, it took me a long time to realize I was having a bit of a workload crisis in about 2015, 16. Um, so, you know, does your school have kind of non-verbal signals, posters on the wall, staff room, uh, is your staff room a warm place? I know COVID and windows open at the moment, but generally speaking, is it a warm place? Is the coffee pot always full? Is there some sugar and milk supply? Those things matter. And I know it's a cost, uh, but those things tend to lead to teacher happiness and happier, happier performing teachers. Teachers also say they manage, and you rightly reported, managing the complex special needs in your classroom and the increasing pupil mental health. There's no surprise that teachers also is the, uh, I think it's the second or third greatest profession with the highest rates of mental health as well. So there's no doubt here that we're in a challenging profession. Um, so remember, pausing in lessons as well as lectures and remotely helps long-term retention. Okay. So let's move on to a project. So this is a, a physical project to try and tackle the biggest issue that all teachers face, marking. So I want to just take you a quick bit of research. Um, I've got a colleague at Cambridge, Jude Brady, who, about, who interviewed a thousand teachers in independent schools and in state schools. You can see here the third one down, marking books, 79%. If I just switch to state school, marking the top one, 99%. And what she, in, in summary, um, her research uh, suggested that both types of teachers in both types of schools 
worked the same number of hours. In fact, they reported about 55 hours average working week. But the biggest difference was that state school teachers believed they were always asked to complete meaningless tasks. So things that were uh, tracking sheets, data collections, evidencing for other purposes other than the impact on the classroom. So I found that was very fascinating. Um, I don't know if you're in, uh, familiar with Teacher Tap. Uh, so I'll check the comments at some point later today, but it's a fabulous little application. I think there's about 10,000 teachers using it every day, three questions on an app, and they gather immediate data. It's fantastic for understanding the needs of the profession. So this slide's a little bit old, but this was a question on, does your school's feedback marking policy say uh, once a week, twice a week, once a half term, and purple pen of progress, for example? You'll see quite clearly here, the, the more challenging your demographics so the IDASI code or free school meals quintile five, your school's more likely to say you will mark once a week or twice a, or twice a fortnight, whatever it would be, and a purple pen of progress. I'm just going to come out my slides, so I hope you can still see my screen at least. Um, teacher tap here. Um, there's a great blog here with the latest influences on teacher workload pressure during COVID. When this was published in October, teachers were saying it already feels like December when we're exhausted. And then hopefully you can see my screen. There's a great book, an academic book on demoralization. And don't conflate being demoralized about your job versus burnout. It's quite interesting. Um, but this one here, you can see um, this third question. I hope we can see this. I might just zoom this in so we can see. Um, they've got the data across the top, different years. But this is the latest one. More teachers are reporting they are burnt out at this time of the year during the virus. This one here, enjoyment, you can also see head teachers and teachers are reporting not enjoying working in schools compared to September and October with the pressure. And then there's another interesting question about marking here, about how long we're spending on marking different months of the year. So the 12th of October, it's starting to shift back, um, shift um up a little bit more time spent on marking. Um, so teacher tap, I'd highly recommend it if you're interested. Now I'm a design and technology teacher and um, I used to get frustrated when observers, school leaders, Ofsted inspectors in my life as a deputy head walking around 110 classrooms. I used to get frustrated with, you can't necessarily impose an assessment policy on so many different subjects with different schema, different subject knowledge. Uh, assessment is going to look very different in PE compared to maths, and it's going to look very different in an English lesson with year 11 compared to an English lesson in year three. So the challenges for schools is how do you get some degree of consistency? And, and I think consistency is probably the wrong thing that we're chasing because you're never going to get 100 percent consistency. So I, I, I've kind of shifted my perspective to think schools should be seeking co coherence. Teachers want clarity about expectations. And then they can veer off to do things in their own specialisms. So my life as a DT teacher, I'd be banging a hammer for, for six weeks. We'd make a chair. There'd be not very much work in the books. And then someone would pop in a month later and say, where's all the work? And much of it had been lost. Um, so that was the kind of roots of my verbal feedback research. Now, here's a question for you before I give you the answer. Um, in the chat box, um, what's the etymological meaning of the word assessment? What does it mean? What's it? Where, where's the word stem from? So I'll, I'll kind of spoil the answer um, before you have a chance to respond. It means to sit beside. So how many of us are sitting on our own marking kids' books or sitting on a computer screen entering data rather than sitting beside kids having micro-assessment conversations? Um, now, obviously, COVID, that's going to be a challenge at the moment. Uh, so I'm going to give you some solutions um, but that we need to move back to the original purpose of assessment. Of course, written assessment has a place. But why do we assume written feedback is the best form? Um, you know, there's many forms. Um, written feedback, verbal feedback, non-verbal feedback. We've got feedback, feed up, feed forward. So at least six different types of providing uh, information to kids. Um, so I conducted a bit of research and I went to UCL and they commissioned some research. And I had 10... 10 schools. So I guess the ones closest to you, um, we've got probably um, Rygate School, um, kind of a couple in London. Um, these schools before the pandemic and I suspect after when things settle, they're quite happy for you to visit. 
these schools have in some of their year 11 teachers not no records of written marking whatsoever and um, they're really stripping back this notion that written feedback is the best form so here are the schools and um, you can see the kind of where their locations are in the central column and then the number on roll on the right hand side so I have to be clear, these schools are the schools that are in the kind of free school meal quintile five, They're very disadvantaged schools in schools where you traditionally be told to mark once a week and with a colored pen. Um, so this was the question they come up with, and we met them for five, five days over the academic year. The research was published last September, and this was their question, to what extent does verbal feedback implemented for two terms improve engagement and outcomes for disadvantaged pupils? Um, so here are the teachers. Here I am working on lots of kind of uh, mark plan teach strategies. I'm going to give you some resources shortly. And also um, a lot of coaching and scripts that they could use to sit beside children. This has now evolved into some more research with the University of Leicester. In the bottom, you'll see Mark Quinn here. Mark, um, former teacher, working with the teachers to help raise the profile of conducting research in the classroom despite you being very busy, and to also uh, think about ethics, gathering research, and thinking more critically about your own work in the classroom. This is the model that he followed, um, asked the question, investigate, innovate, and reflect, and kind of pose the question, uh, a kind of tentative claim that if I don't mark books, does it actually improve outcomes? So we had the teachers kind of saying those things halfway through the project that it did. Um, so I'm going to skip this one because I want to give you the resources. Um, I'm going to put in the chat box. In fact, I'm going to leave it there for you rather than go out of my slides. If you type this hyperlink into your website browser on your computer, not your mobile phone, so bit.ly forward slash MPT cartoons, you'll get 34 PDFs that you can have from me. These are all the solutions that I developed with my own teacher's and the stuff that I've been uh, working with schools around the world for the last three years. These are one minute summaries. So if you don't have time to read the book, and I suspect you don't, these one minute summaries are a great way into some of the research, the practice and the theory. It needs to have a capital MPT to work. So perhaps Emma or someone from the admin can put that in the chat box for everyone and circulate that. That will download a zip file. And when you export it, there'll be 34 PDFs inside. Um, so you can use those to have a look at in your meetings as professional development opportunities. Um, some of the strategies that the teachers used, um, the yellow box strategy, it doesn't have to be yellow, it could be any color, it's a coaching method, find one thing and fix. I now call it zonal feedback. I ban the word marking because feedback comes in at least six forms. Um, so it's important to kind of shift the narrative. Um, live feedback research, it does all these things. So you'll find this in one of the sketch notes in the cartoon. You'll be doing all these things. Um, I've got a, um, I'm a huge fan of visualizers. I suspect during the pandemic, uh, many more people have been using them. I'm just going to hold one up to the my camera so you can see it. This is a little IPVO model. They're about um, 30, 40 pound. You can get different models. This one's a bit more expensive. And you can get Wi-Fi enabled ones. You can get kids' work beamed on the screen. Uh, they're really good for creating a dialogue, modeling the work. The most effective teachers model. So it's important that we kind of, I do it first, kids watch me. Now we'll do it together. Now you do it. And I come around the classroom, monitor and clarify any misconceptions. So these strategies are all in the book and were used to, to kind of challenge that written feedback isn't the best form. Um, some of you will be familiar with Barrett Rosenshine's 17 Principles of Effective Instruction. I wrote about that in Mark Plan Teach in 2016 uh, 17. Um, I also looked at this piece of research. Uh, this is by Nickel and McFarlane Dick, Seven Principles of Good Feedback, very similar to Barrett Rosenshine. And when you study education research, which I'm currently doing pretty much part time in my doctoral work, is a lot of the research in education says the same thing. Why? Because education is a very small sector. It's always underfunded. The evidence always says the same thing. So it's limited, but actually affirms all the things that we know. So it manifests itself in Mr. McGill, who might be a bit cynical and say, oh, we've seen this or we've heard this before. Well, of course you have. You know, if we think of retrieval practice, the earliest study is in 1909 by Edwina Abbott, and you can go back to um, Herman Ebenhaus, 1895. So these things have been around for 100 plus years. Um, so it's important to be immersed with research and use it to inform our practice. 
Um, I would argue that these seven could be squeezed into four to make it a bit more manageable. Number one, here's a good one. Uh, I'll model it first, watch me. Then number two, three, four, and five, I could squeeze it into one, initiate some assessment and feedback. Here's a question. Well done, Ross. Have you thought about A or B? Why did you choose C instead of D? Um, and then number six is where all teachers spend their time, energies, and efforts. You, you, you plug in the interventions in the lesson and plan outside to then plan for the next lesson. And this is a feedback loop. So I think this would be a very useful way as a curriculum model and a lesson plan tool to help reduce workload. Many of you will have seen the whole class feedback sheet. 30 books. I don't mark the books. I annotate this one sheet. And then I use this to provide verbal feedback to the students around the classroom. And I might target it in three groups. Every classroom in the world has three groups of students. Students that are high performing and can get off with your instruction. Two that need a little bit of script or feedback and then off they go. And then the three, the group that always struggle and need a bit more attention, love and care. So, you know, think about your classroom in that respect and how you can do this. Now, I'll take it again a little bit further. Here's the whole class feedback sheet with the three types of feedback. Again, think you would be annotating the sheet looking at the 30 books. Number one, here's a good example, but I'm going to use feed up. So if you look at the small uh, black text underneath, this is comparing the actual status of the new piece of work with the target. That's feed up. Feedback, which is what most of us do or say at least, and when it comes to kind of providing feedback, is comparing the new piece of work to where they were before. And then, and then number three, um, feed forward is explaining the target status. So pretty much when we get into exam territory and we start to explain to kids how they move up to the next level. So think about your feedback in your groups, other ways of providing feedback rather than things always having to be written down. Everything and anything I'm reading in the world of research always comes back to retrieval practice. This is where you all need to spend your time and efforts quizzing. Uh, multiple choice questions. There are 10 benefits there. If we even look at number nine, increasing learning that is lost. Thinking of recovery curriculum and all the time kids have missed out of school. I've been trying to push as much as I can in my own little uh, self. Is It's not always teaching kids new material, particularly during lockdown. It's about helping them recover learning that's lost. So sometimes we need to help kids understand that they need to repeat and recover work that they've already done before rather than teaching new material. And this is a challenge we all face as teachers when we have to teach to the test. So 10 benefits there. That's all on my website. And that's influenced by a fabulous book you'll see in the bottom right hand corner, Powerful Teaching by Dr. Pooja Agarwal and Patrice Baines. And they're all on my site in podcasts. You can listen to what they say. So I'm going to just pause and then I'm going to finish with um, some of the recommendations that I'd ask you to do. And then I'm going to bring them to life in some of the workshops. So any questions on the chat box, ping them through and I'll get, um, I'm sure someone will pose them my way shortly. Okay, so here's the report. So of all the strategies that the teachers used for the verbal feedback project, you'll see there was 13 teachers, all secondary school teachers in disadvantaged schools. On the right hand side, you'll see the, the, the kind of popularity. Without a doubt, live marking in the moment, visualizer was most popular, as was the zonal feedback, so the, the yellow box method. Um, here's the report. So perhaps someone from admin can put this in the chat box. I'll circulate all the slides, all the resources uh, with you uh, later today. But there is the hyperlink, bit.ly forward slash capital VFF findings. Um, this was predominantly written by the teachers. They kind of shared their before and after kind of resources, their thinking. And it's not a, a difficult piece of academic research to, to read. And I was really delighted when UCL funded this because I knew as a teacher that when I spoke to kids in class or I went to go and do learning walks in PE or maths or drama with an Ofsted inspector, I knew it was just a snapshot and there was much more work going on behind the scenes that could not be evaluated in the moment. So I wanted to have some academic research to back it up. And this is it. So it's not a difficult paper to read. I know you're all incredibly busy, but when times uh, come back to normal and marking comes back as the number one issue, please can I encourage at least your school leadership team to look at this piece of research 
and the orange pamphlet there are all the resources which I'll send to you as well. Um, okay, this was my takeaway. When verbal feedback structured and routine, when accompanied with a reduction of written feedback, it does not negatively affect the engagement of pupils or their attainment. So engagement, um, many definitions here, hands up to lessons, punctuality to class, reduction in exclusions, reward points on sims. There are so many ways of evidence in verbal feedback other than just evidence in a book. So it's really important to, to define how you would evidence verbal feedback. Um, so getting started, everyone. So a um, couple of things I just want to share. Um, this is kind of uh, finishing off with what I've seen on my travels. When teachers leave the profession, that, that process starts long before it actually happens. In my career, 25 years in the classroom, I left twice. Um, the first time was through redundancy, um, and I came back after six weeks. The second time was just recently, um, and I, you know, I'm getting the itch to, to come back in, but I find that my pressures um, and my focus shifted more to a kind of macro level, supporting schools all over the country, as well as uh, further afield, uh, and trying to support teachers more directly rather than pupils. Um, if I could just signpost this, this is a topic that we don't like to talk about, toxic schools. Sadly, in our profession, there are schools that don't get things right and promote a bit more of a bullying, high stakes accountability culture. Um, it's a great piece of research I published with Dr. Helen Woodley in a great book called Toxic Schools. This is informed by Helen's PhD research, where she did an ethnography, which is a very close study of six teachers who were working in toxic schools. And these are um, the kind of kind of high indications. Number one, high st staff turnover. Uh, if you're not familiar with number six, Balkanism. If you think of former Yugoslavia, the kind of countries in that part of the uh, Europe, uh, all defragmented into new states. That's pretty much the analogy of departments in a school working in isolation rather than together in the big picture. Um, so there's lots of things there, but I just want to signpost this. A um, bit of a kind of controversial title for a book, The Arsehole Survival Guide, but it certainly got my attention when I read it. Um, I'm just going to put on there, are you working with a bully? Um, in the book, it says, before you diagnose yourself with mental health problems, just take a look around you and just see if you're working with a bully. Um, I've worked with a bully in my career. Um, it's probably influenced my own workload and my reason to leave a toxic school. And then you, you learn through your career how to stand up for yourself or how to try and avoid these situations. But we'll have all been or have observed some of these. And it is a topic we don't necessarily like to talk about. But I think the more that we do, particularly in a new climate where more of us are talking about our mental health, I think it's important that we do so that the next generation of teachers don't necessarily learn from these bad habits. Um, so I hope those things help. My top tip for reducing workload, emails. They're just a screen to universities, historical emails, things like that. Um, your devices are set to uh, push the email. So what that means is if I push an email to you, you'll get it instantly. You need to go in, particularly on your mobile phones, is go in and change the settings to fetch which means that when you log in and you press collect your emails, you're choosing when to deal with your workload rather than Ross always interrupts you. And it's another great tip for it, your desktop in school where you can just switch things off. I know it's a challenge because sometimes you need emergency announcements, but let's face it, when there's an emergency, someone always comes and tells you anyway. Um, so uh, that would be a great tip. Now you said on the workload survey earlier, emails was an issue. If you haven't ever looked at this, go into your settings on your mobile phone and make the decision. They, it's designed this way to control you and keep you connected. Take back control and switch it off. You'll be happier for it, trust me. I also leave my mobile phone downstairs at night. For 10 years, I used to always take it upstairs and put it by my bed. Now I leave it downstairs. It dramatically changes your um, work, work life, mental health. Um, now, there's 50 of these, but I'm just gonna give you 10. Have a look at these. This is a real staff well-being policy. Does your school have a well-being policy? Does your trust? I hope you do. Um, are these achievable? Because this school's certainly doing them. And I'm going to signpost you to the school and you can have a look at it. They've now got 50. Um, but you no, know, no lesson plans of any kind, no kind of show-off lessons. 
cover. I mean, whether, whether, whether number three on here is still applicable during COVID, I know we're all kind of pulling, uh, uh, you know, we're all kind of rowing the boat together, so to speak, at this particular point in uh, the pandemic. Um, but these are some useful things to, as a starting point. So the school is Bar Beacon School. There are loads of others, um, but there's the link there. I'll send you these on the slide. Just click the link or click on the image or just type Bar Beacon School. If you don't have a well-being policy, here's a great platform to look at stuff and think, right, what would we include? Do all staff have a say in the well-being policy? What are practical? What are achievable? And ultimately, is well-being a school priority rather than just some kind of tick box um, just to keep people happy? Um, so finishing off, finishing off. Um, this is an old document from uh, ATL, now the National Education Union. Um, do you work in a healthy workplace? There's, there's, in fact, there's six. Six indications that you work in a healthy uh, school school culture. Um, think about, um, I don't know if anyone's ever taken part in Investors and People, but they do a fabulous kind of audit of professional development, appraisal, staff voice, and teacher well-being. And it's a really good um, thing to consider. And again, COVID, prior to the COVID, a good, uh, did you ever have a return to work interview with your line manager if you were off sick? Um, are your managers trained in people skills? You know, these things make a bit of a difference to a happier workforce. Um, so some conclusions. This is what I think I've seen on my travels. Some schools on the left, Ofsted, parents say £40,000 a year fees, whatever it is, uh, school closes down, re reinvented, that type of stuff. On the right-hand side, Mr. McGill doesn't want to contribute to CPD. He's been teaching 30 years. He doesn't want to be observed. He doesn't want to show off an observation to the rest of the staff. Or I go and work in another school, independent setting or international. I, I make my own curriculum choices. I don't get anyone to look at my books or my lessons. And I kind of fall behind in pedagogy. This is a rubber band effect. And it's really hard to kind of stay in the middle. So I guess rhetorically to you is where are you professionally on this scale? Where is your school or where is your immediate team, your department or your year team? It's very hard to stay in the middle. Why? Because teachers leave and go, uh, pupils leave and go, the school changes. But I would argue that many schools need a hymn sheet, which is a small dose of accountability. You might spend two or three years developing this culture to then loosen up uh, to become autonomous. So I'm researching teacher agency and teacher voice. And sadly, when you compare England against all other, I think it was 45, the research, OECD countries, teachers in England have one of the lowest teacher voice, teacher autonomies in all OECD countries. So uh, curriculum choice, uh, those types of things. So those are the things that I've seen in all schools that I've visited across the world. And the happier schools, I'm going to use the word happier quite loosely, are the ones that are in the middle. They bring their teachers together regularly, even through Zoom, to talk about teaching and learning, to make the classroom the central business of what teachers need to do. And they're constantly, uh, all teachers have a voice, even the NQTs, and they're looking at research thinking, oh, Ross said that, that's interesting, let's think about this. We don't like this, it's not applicable for our setting, but let's tweak it and refine it. And it's a constant process. And I would argue, it probably happens on a weekly basis. And given what I know about memory, uh, and I'm going to share this in my workshop later this afternoon, is 20, 30 minutes maximum for a staff CPD session, he says, in a conference during the day. Uh, but good for retention, which is why I've been trying to build in some pauses. Um, here's a CPD culture plan, something that you can't do straight away. It's going to take 12 to 18 months. But this is what I think I've seen schools do to reshape their teaching culture and the things that they would need to do. do you, is your CPD always protected? Is it calendared? Is it public? Does everybody have a say? Is it or is it just always Ross, the CPD leader, leading the CPD sessions? Do you have kind of work workshop marketplace down the corridor with 10 or 12 classrooms going on where staff can choose where they go? And they some of them are directed and some of them are voluntary. Those types of things seem to be better places for staff uh, professional development. I'll finish with this. I've kind of just thrown this in at the end, given that we're, you know, going into a lockdown and we may or may not be teaching remotely. If you're not, you already are dealing with some children uh, remotely. A um, piece of research from the health industry, and I think there are many things we can use here for teaching in a virtual environment. 
good teaching is good teaching. Um, teacher and gaze, when I look at the material, it helps retention. When I pause, all the activities that I use, the question, all the kind of tools, all these things make a big difference for retention. Um, and, you know, can you build up a relationship with people online? I'd like to hope so. And when you know your kids better, you've got a probably, you know, safeguard and all those things with context. Uh, you can make a big difference remotely. So um, there's a bit of research. I've explained this on my blog, and I hope that will help. Um, I'm going to finish um, with this summary. These are the things that I've tried to do. I'm not going to read them all back over. Um, but some of the kind of com things that I've been advocating for a number of years, everyone's responsible for their own workload as well as each other's. And we need to think about, you know, during the pandemic and when we get past it, how we can, you know, teacher work is always going to be an issue. So how can we keep teachers focused on their core business to ultimately stop teachers leaving the profession and improve teacher happiness? You know, the average lifespan of a teacher is 13 years. I'm surprised I made 25 years looking back. Um, but, you know, think about where you are in the teaching sector, you know, with burnout at the moment during COVID. Is it sustainable? Probably not. So what can your schools do to support you? Is mental health a conversation or is it always swept under the carpet? And um, there are some practical things that we can all do as well as what we can do collectively. And um, finish with this, teaching is a team sport. It's important to share. And if we don't, there's that special place reserved in hell. Um, so I hope that helps everyone. There's my email. I'm going to send you all the slides, all the resources. Um, and I uh, I hope that helps uh, give you a kind of sense of the state of the nation at the moment. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks, Ross. That's really good. And um, we've got some questions in the chat. If you're OK, just to uh, yeah. share some thoughts on them. Uh, I'm just going to I can bring it in straight into StreamYard. Uh, so one from uh, Emma at Clean Park Farm. And I think this was in context of verbal feedback. Uh, are there any primary schools who you have worked with that's where this has been effective? And can we visit or speak to them virtually? Yeah, um, I, I can probably, um, there's a couple of schools. I can think of one school in Croydon. I think that's not too far from you. Um, and there's another school, uh, I don't know the exact little village, but somewhere in Oxfordshire that I know both primary schools that I work with that are using verbal feedback techniques. So I'll make a note and I'll send them uh, through the kind of my resources and we can circulate those contact details to people. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Ross. Uh, another question, uh, just bring it in here. So in developing our trust-wide policy on well-being, we aim to include elements around connection, physical uh, health, giving, learning and mindfulness. Is there anything else that you think we should be thinking about as part of this process? Um, I, I'm assuming this is for teachers, not necessarily pupils. Yes. Um, well, you know, I think looking at the kind of social, emotional, mental health aspects for teachers is a great start. Um, I do look at the investors and people um, process that I talked about. I've used it three times in three different schools. And I think uh, about three or four years ago, they recently reformed their standards. So it's actually harder to get that kind of traditional bronze, silver, gold. But it's a brilliant um, tool. It tests staff voice, staff well-being, as well as appraisal systems. Uh, you know, a lot of work I'm advocating now, uh, looking at staff setting their own research targets for appraisal rather than the line manager sets three. And I think that also helps um, these areas. Um, you know, things that I've done in my own life as a CPD leader, you know, having um, as part of the workshop model for CPD, yoga sessions, um, specialists coming in, offering kind of pensions, yoga, those types of things. And sometimes we've made one of our inset days. Um, you know, I, 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 I'd be honest, that sometimes I've been a bit skeptical about team building stuff. But actually, when you go through it all, it does make a big difference to morale. It's a question of, is it just a one-off or is it part of this culture? I think once it's part of the culture, it then becomes uh, very normal and uh, kind of really does make a difference to staff morale. And finally, one last question that I know is uh, sort of important uh, to me on a personal level. Um, we're increasingly using one-to-one -one devices, Google Classroom, Seesaw, et cetera. What would you recommend to us uh, as we look to provide more feedback to pupils uh, for work completed dig digitally? Um, so uh, uh, lots of things. I mean, there's a great book published by uh, Steve Higgins and Lee Elliott Major. Lee Elliott Major uh, was the person who originally founded the Pupil Premium Toolkit with Education Endowment Foundation. And their research uh, talks about what works. 
And it, uh, to coin the kind of uh, quote from Banana Rama, it's not what you do, it's what um, the way that you do it, and that's what gets results. Um, you know, there's lots of research about one-to-one -one devices. It's not necessarily, it's how kids use it as and when that makes a difference. But obviously COVID, with all kids needing to have access remotely, um, the things that I've been doing, so one of my secrets for all the blogs is I've been using verbal feedback through microphone technology for a decade. I used to work with a head teacher who was paralyzed from the neck down and he couldn't use his hands. So he had a microphone on his desk to, to script emails or to write policies. So I stole the idea. I put a microphone. I've got one here on my table here. Um, and I would switch the, the voice activation software to write reports, to write marking and to provide feedback. Um, there's a, I'll finish with a good little tip. Um, there's a great little um, mantra I use, praise, probe, identify, plan, and lock. And it's a nice little script to follow when you're saying, uh, so well done, Ross, great praise, great piece of work. Probe, why did you do this instead of that? Um, let's identify two or three solutions. Let's plan ahead uh, what you can do. And then before I finish the conversation, you repeat back to me, lock it in. What are you going to do to uh, fix this problem? And you can, with, with Patch, you can do it in 30 seconds. So you can do it virtually as well as with your microphone. You can speak it and watch it get dictated on the screen rather than laboriously typing everything. Also a great tip for writing reports. Excellent. I know that's something that uh, our staff will, will really appreciate. I'm just scrolling through to see if there's any questions that we've missed. Uh, I don't think so. So I'm just going to uh, bring Emma in just to say a few final words. Ross, thank you so much for your session. I personally found the polls really interesting and lots to think about there. So thank you for those. Over the past year within my role of inclusion and safeguarding, I've been involved in many conversations and actions around mental health and well-being, both for pupils and staff alike. As many of you are already aware, we are currently working on a new um, LEO wellbeing strategy, which aims to pull together all of the positive work that is already going on across the trust and also look for further ways that this can be enhanced. We will be seeking the thoughts and opinions from all of our staff and children over the next year to help impact on this strategy. Ross, you've given us lots to consider in this, so thank you once again. My pleasure. Thank you.